Welcome to The Great Humbling. I'm Dougal Tyne, co-founder of the Dog Mountain Project and a school called home. In the spring of 2020, I began recording these conversations with the poet and recovering sustainability consultant Ed Gillespie. We call them The Great Humbling because this feels like a time of being humbled, brought down to earth and, if we're lucky, back into connection with land and soil and with each other. Thank you for listening. All right, Ed, it is, it's nearing the middle of December. I am sitting here wearing my Christmas jumper. <laughs> it looks splendid. Thank you. It's a Christmas jumper with llamas on it that I was sent by my sister a few years ago. But I have to say that 2023 has been the first year where I have fully embraced it or um you know, seen it seen a use for it because i just hit this point just over a week ago of going ah oh, oh right my energy for the year is close to spent mm. and i thought ah, oh, i'm gonna put my christmas jumper on and show up to every call and every conversation i'm having wearing this as a gesture that you know whatever the calendar says it might be advent but i've already i've already fast forwarded to the the holidays so that's that's me how how are you ed um i yeah i i'm i'm not feeling dissimilar you've had a very busy year dougald in particular so uh i can understand why you might be feeling like that it's funny you mention advent because uh my friend sophie howarth has been doing a lovely little offering um of sort of light in the darkness a sort of daily poem um for advent and the last week's all been about hope but she actually shared uh, an Inuit word the other day. Uh, I'm going to mispronounce it, but either guessing something like Katsiluni, which means sitting together expectantly in darkness. Um, and it is kind of what this time of year is supposed to be about, isn't it? Hunkering down. There's nothing growing. There's not much to do in the garden or in the fields. Um, so it is that time of rumination, contemplation, reflection, and arguably recharging um, after all of the year's exertions. So, yeah, I'm very much in a in a similar headspace. I've come in from the cold of the shed. Um, I'm now in the relative warmth of the mill. Um, so, yeah, I'm comfy. We've been living inside a Christmas card for weeks now, actually. We're having the kind of winter that I might have imagined life uh 60 degrees north would be like which is not not the kind of winter that we get every year nowadays in sweden but there's about a foot of snow out there and alfie took me out sledging yesterday so i can't really complain and your beard was looking pretty spectacular in the frost the other day it did it, yeah my beard <laughs> got all sort of polar explorer from the the walk to school and back that was when we had a couple of days when it went down to minus 22 yeah. But the other thing that just that sort of just dawned on me as I was preparing for this was there was a parallel universe, another timeline, in which I was meant to have made a trip by train to Amsterdam to take part in some kind of event this weekend where there were going to be ten of us speaking, and uh, the other speakers included Slavoj Žižek and friend of this show Brian Eno, and I'm told that it's because. Uh, Brian had second thoughts about it, that they cancelled the third day of the event where the two of us were due to be speaking. But my, I am glad that I did not get on a train last week. And in, instead, I've spent the weekend being in the place where I live. And on Friday night, we went to Christmas dinner at the, the little cafe in our... I need a word that's like between village and town because it's sort of halfway between the two. But um, it was a Christmas dinner for the committee of this thing called Skogsvallen, which is this um, people's park uh, on the edge of Ustavola, which Ed, it has played host to all of the greats in musical history. I'm not kidding you. Simon and Garfunkel, wow. Miriam McCabe, status quo. <laughs> Dave D, Dozy Mick and Titch, all of them have played Skogsvallen, this this venue on the edge of this 
place of 1500 residents Astavolo it was the third venue on the rock train when international acts got to Sweden in the the rock and roll years and so Anna and I have been drafted onto the committee as it heads towards its 90th anniversary in a couple of years time to see if we can revive the international connections so instead of going off to Amsterdam I was I was firmly at home doing that and then inviting the neighbors over for mulled wine on Saturday afternoon and then going to a gingerbread party in a house three doors along yesterday so that's been exactly what was called for at this end of the the year after all of the other stuff that I've done is just to come home to the place where we're slowly arriving I'm dying to know who your dream booking would be for the 90th anniversary I mean, come on, Ed. Uh, it wasn't even me who said this. It was Anna who said, got to be able to get the KLF to come and play <laughs> at Skogs <laughs> Well, Well, it's, it's weird, isn't it? I mean, no sooner had we recorded that last episode than the KLF popped up again. And I don't know what weird synchronicity was going on there. But, I mean, it was literally within days that they re-emerged um, with another prank about you know, KLF care homes um, from the ravers to the grave, um, which amused me in a vain attempt to get a Christmas number one. Although actually uh, the track is a kind of cover version of the Harry Nielsen classic. Everyone's talking um, at me, which actually, again, doesn't feel inappropriate for the time. You know, everyone's talking at me. I don't hear a word they're saying, um, which pretty much encapsulates social media pretty much <laughs> uh, in, in a sort of in an odd way but I, I've been reflecting on on that idea that we were talking about last week um, or, or last episode in regard to idea space and actually in the sense of loss of some of these big voices that we've lost um, you know most recently Benjamin Zephaniah um, but obviously Shane McGowan a couple of weeks ago and you know Sinead O'Connor earlier this year uh, just reflecting on what that does in idea space or in that sort of collective unconscious when suddenly tens, if not hundreds of millions of people suddenly re-engage with an artist's work um, in a way that perhaps they took for granted while that person was still with us. And I was looking just on Spotify alone. I mean, Fairy Tale of New York has had 350 million listens. Um, And that's in total, obviously, not all in the last few weeks, but obviously tens of millions have been in the last few weeks. And and I I went back to some of and I've been a huge fan of Benjamin Zephaniah for, you know, for my whole life, basically, Um, particularly from the sort of the poetic perspective. And I've just had two of his poems going round and round in my head, um, you know, to do with me, which is, you know, his classic one about what's this got to do with me? And, And it's a brilliant sort of satire it's funny it's poignant it's provocative around the sort of hand-wringing approach that people can have when they absolve themselves of all responsibility um and the wrong radio station which you know there's also a sort of drum and bass version of you know i've been listening to the wrong radio station (laughs) and those two tracks um yeah, really, really, really always resonated with me. And I've just had them on a loop in my head um, for the last week or so since since he went. Mm-hmm. And I just wonder, you know, what that what that does um, in idea space when you have this sort of tremendous, like very deep, I think, re-engagement with someone's work. Mm, yeah. I tell you, the, the other Benjamin Zephaniah poem that's been going round and round for me, I don't know if you know this one, Ed, it's the, the one about the hedgehog. I'm in love with a hedgehog. And it's uh, it's all about this hedgehog that comes to his garden. But it was in a book. We we got this book that we, Alfie was given of a poem for each day of the year. And that was by a country mile, his favourite his favorite poem in the whole book. So I I, uh, I told him when, when I heard the news, I was like, yeah, Benjamin Zephaniah, who wrote the hedgehog poem, he's gone. Yeah. What else have you been reading, Ed, apart from Benjamin Zephaniah? Oh, I've been, I've been reading an absolute doorstop. Um, of a book you know when a book is so heavy in its hardcover that you're worried that if you nod off reading it in bed at night it might actually bash you in the face (laughs) um it's the deluge by um stephen markley which i think is close on 900 pages um it's so long that the paper is sort of 
Bible thin. Uh, the pages have to be done on a lightweight uh, paper. So, I mean, it's it's an incredible piece of work. I'm about halfway, and no doubt we will come back to it. But uh, that has been occupying all of my reading time, as you can imagine, because it takes a long time to get through a, a book of that sort of immense, epic scale. But it's set in a near future Um I would say it's kind of a through topia uh, book about climate and and the kind of poly crises, but it it certainly doesn't pull its punches, and I'm certainly nowhere near the through topia bit. I'm very much in the dystopia bit, so that's been that's been weighing heavily on me um, in every sense. Well, I don't know that I've been even managing much time for reading, apart from the fact that I have. I have caught up with the book that you were talking to me and telling me about last episode, the KLF book. So we'll come to that. But what I did um, find myself doing, I was sent back to the work of someone who you must have crossed paths with, Ed, Pam Warhurst, Mm. who started Incredible Edible Todmorden. Yes, the legendary Pam. I and I I was looking back at her work for something that I was preparing for, and I found this video of her speaking it must have been at nesta in london in about 2011 and you know various people who we know were in the room um sam conniff had the unfortunate job of having to follow pam and i remember being there that day and feeling sorry for him having to go next after 10 minutes of this absolute powerhouse of a woman from west yorkshire telling the story and the way that she tells it she had come she says she'd come to London to listen to a talk about climate change. And she says it takes two and a half hours to get back to Todmorden on the train. And by the time she got there, she'd figured it out. She went round to her friend Mary's house for a cup of tea. She said, Mary, I found us a forever project, which is you know, just the there's something that she talks about there of the kind of the power of a project that's not you know this isn't like three years of grant funding or you know we're aiming to achieve this by this year it's like this is you know this will be part of our lives for the rest of our lives and i think there's something like all sorts of people who've inspired me this year in one way or another have had that there's a sense of sort of Mm. having having made a vow or having kind of taken on something that you're not going to live to see the fruit of yeah and being good with that but what really struck me as well was that uh, her response to having gone to this talk about climate change wasn't to come back and try and do something in her community that starts by getting everyone together and showing them a video about climate change. It's It started with going, oh, we're going to grow food, because that's one thing we know that we're going to need to get better at in any plausible future. We're going to have to reskill at this. We're going to do it by taking all of the the unloved bits of land around the town and loving them, mm. growing stuff there. And she said, "We're not going to we're not going to ask permission because if we go to the council and ask them for permission, they're going to say no, and then they're going to feel bad, and we don't want to make people feel bad." And anyway, you know, who can be against loving unloved land? So you know, people are going to people are going to be glad we did it afterwards. So we we'll just we'll just get on and do it. And she said, "And we're not going to go and ask people for money." We'll tell them, you know, when we get stuck, we're going to come to you and ask you for help, but we can start this ourselves. And just the sense of the shift of agency, the sense of power involved in that, rather than starting with a story that says, you know, if you give us this pool of resources, then we can do all of the amazing things on this list, which is how so many projects in the world start out. And uh, and the last bit that I really loved was uh, the definition of who it's for. It's like, it's not for everyone, but if you eat, you're in. <laughs> so if you, if you don't eat, if you don't need food, it's probably not for you. But otherwise, you know, otherwise there might be a place for you somewhere within the mix of this. And just everything about that. And I remember hearing her, you know, whatever it is, 12 years ago, give that talk. And coming back to it 12 years on, it still feels as powerful and doesn't feel doesn't feel dated and there are Mm. lots of people and projects that have taken inspiration from that or that are embodying the same spirit from other starting points and to me when i look back over this year 
the things that have that character to them, right, of all of the conversations I've been in, all of the stuff that I've had the chance to visit or write about or talk with people about, it's those things that give me a kind of anchored sense of hope and of there being things worth doing. Mm. Yeah, she's definitely a force of nature. Is, is Pam. <laughs> I remember, I can't remember, I, was in, I think I was at an event with her and we were speaking alongside each other. I can't remember who went first, but I was probably in the Sam Conniff position. <laughs> um, but I also remember afterwards, you know, her going out the back for a rolly um, and just being like so straight talking, like so no nonsense, as you say, cutting to the essence of what a forever project uh, means in practice. Yeah. So, Ed, listen, we got halfway through you telling me the story of the KLF and we got sent off on so many fertile digressions. And I know, I mean, you've probably heard back from listeners. I've certainly heard back from listeners. I had one listener sent me a five minute voicemail all about, um, you know, how much she'd appreciated this particular episode and the ways in which we were showing up to it. Um, So I'm, I'm really glad to come back having you know, gone away on the strength of your recommendation and you know, listened to the book now. So I, I, I know some of the rest of the story, but I want you to take us I want you to take us through it and see where it leads us. Yeah, there's a couple of nice things to bridge it as well. Um, you know, building on your sort of Pam Warhurst story. Um the poet Tom Sharp was doing a presentation in London, which another mutual friend of ours uh, was at, who said, and he sent me a clip from the presentation, which was a quote from Robert Anton Wilson, uh, which said, you should view the world as a conspiracy run by a very closely knit group of nearly omnipotent people. Uh, you know, so far so good and you should think of those people as yourself and your friends uh which very much plays to incredible edible todmorden you know let's like re-envision um our town um but also the sort of big callback i think to part one of our sort of klf excursion was this idea of a big story that you can play a, an absolutely key role in but be completely unwittingly involved um, and I heard an extraordinary story um, about a week after we did the episode from uh, a guy I work with who was who was deeply involved and deeply enmeshed in the Northern Ireland peace process, you know, in the build up to the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and he told me a story about the first time they ever got the Democratic Unionist, Unionists um, and Sinn Féin in a room together at Stormont Castle. So this was, you know, Reverend Ian Paisley and um, Jerry Adams. Uh, and they really didn't know, you know, whether this would be an effective meeting. It was such a kind of moment of brinksmanship in a way. But they got them in the room and they sort of stepped out the door um, and let them begin their conversation. So it wasn't facilitated. It was very much like, you know, this has got to be direct and unfiltered. Um, and he said about half an hour in, you know, that someone came to the door and said, can you send out for pizza? And they thought, oh, this is a good sign. This is a really good sign. So um, they called up a pizza place and said, you know, can you deliver us some pizza? And they said no. Um, four pizza places later, they still hadn't got anyone who was able to deliver a pizza. At this point, they started to get slightly panicky um, because quite a lot riding on it, actually. You know, <laughs> um, there is a pizza delivery service somewhere in Belfast that the fifth one they phoned which finally agreed to be able to deliver pizza that probably has no idea what a key role that that pizza played in the Northern Ireland peace process and the Good Friday Agreement but I really hope one day they find out but I I just wanted to share that as an amazing story of you know uh playing an absolutely key role in in a massive narrative that you're not aware of yeah I love it Wow. Pizza making and peacemaking. It's all part of the same weave. It is. Exactly. Exactly. And uh, and I wanted to use that as a sort of segue to pick up on um, the, the KLF story again, because I think where we ended, we were talking about, you know, the sort of this magical act of burning uh, the million pounds that Alan Moore described. And, and it very much fits into Bill Drummond's idea of, of what he calls a liberation loophole. Um, And he says, you know, every idea you ever have begins full of faults and weaknesses and reasons not to do it, 
I'm sure Palm Warhurst would have had this. You know, it, it's riddled with contradictions and you know all the excuses you can think of to try and kill it off. But what the liberation loophole that Drummond talks about does is it gives you the permission to allow the idea to grow under its own logic. Uh, and in his words, protected from the withering scorn of rationality. And, and so you have to accept the contradictions in, in the early stages of an idea. Um, and I think the, the best manifestation of this is if you actually go back and watch the video to Justified Ancients of Moo Moo with Tammy Wynette. Which I have done since we recorded our last episode, I have to confess. You'll know what it looks like then, you know, so it's got African dancers. Um, it has Corti and Drummond in like these full long red robes with foot long white horns projecting out of their hoods you don't see their faces at all uh, there's a submarine uh, a massive temple i mean it, it's idiosyncratic to say the least and i think it has obviously done several passes through the liberation loophole um in order to accept its inherent contradiction and at the top of the te- at, the, at the top of the temple pyramid is the the queen of country yeah. um singing they're they're justified and they're ancient and they drive an ice cream van and what i didn't know was that it relaunched her career yeah. it gave her her first mainstream hit since 1969 yeah. And uh, it's, it's a lovely thought that not only, and, and at least according to like, the, the story goes anyway, that they're in the studio and Jimmy Courty says, you know what this track needs? It needs Tammy Wynette. Um, Bill Drummond's like, you're right. And goes off and starts making phone calls and within 20 minutes is talking to her in a dressing room backstage in Nashville. And that's how they end up roping her into it. But what I love is that this this idea that these two stories, these two paths cross in a way that is kind of generative for both because it fulfills the sort of Bill Drummond vision of making the perfect pop single and it launches a whole new chapter of Tammy Wynette's career. Well, exactly. Except the contradictions. Yes. Totally accepting the contradictions. And so you have this incredible moment. Um, and that KLF story, you know, because almost that, that single is the culmination um, of everything. You know, they win the Band of the Year, British Band of the Year at the Brit Awards, you know, which um, they then end the ceremony by mock machine gunning the entire audience um which obviously was slightly disturbing um and then performing on stage with a little known east anglian band um who a friend of mine used to flat share with uh, called extreme noise terror um whose name for those of the uh, uninitiated does exactly what it says on the tin and so at the brit awards you had this extreme noise terror version of the klf played you know to pretty much the shock and horror of the entire audience who'd not heard or come across like what we now know as noise core you know like You've got Bill Drummond <laughs> shouting over the top of it, trying yeah. to do the rap from yeah. the original song uh, losing his track and just laughing It's not easy listening you know, you're not going to find, you know, a K-Tel Records version of Extreme Noise Terror's greatest hits. Um, but, and then afterwards, uh, this is the sort of the blunt bit, is, you know, they basically killed the KLF and they deleted all of their records. You know, they decatalogued the lot, which some people have estimated that alone actually probably cost them something like five million quid in lost earnings so burning the million quid actually felt like a you know a flash in the pan when they actually have sort of self-sabotaged themselves uh by delisting and what really struck me and this is where higgs sort of sets out his big argument was this weird period of the early 90s you know and this is when i was at university it was my sort of coming of age as well so i guess that's why it chimes with me but you know, you've got Gen X, you've got um, Linklater's Slacker um, coming out. You've got Fukuyama writing about the end of history. Uh, and it's what Eric Hobsbawm, you know, the kind of historian, described as the short 20th century. 
this period from yeah the, the the 20th century from 1914 to 1989 basically isn't it and Hobsbawm's first exactly it's like you know the start of the first world war was an absolutely catastrophic end to an era it was when the 20th century you know and that mechanized destruction really took off um and the end of the cold war so you know what we're what we were living through at that point is this sort of what next moment you know the end of the end of the cold war has happened there is this sort of creeping nihilism you've got kurt cobain killing himself bill hicks dies you know and it's in this context it's in this moment that the klf burn a million quid so the bit that tends to go missing from you know the history of that moment is that the if you look at so gen x which has become a kind of marketing term mm. to bracket a certain demographic if you go and read douglas copeland's novel generation x which is where it comes from at the end of the book there's three pages of statistics about a generation that are growing up poorer than their parents and it's actually this moment where you know the kind of broadly spread prosperity within American society had peaked about 1973, the beginning of the the oil crisis. And that's a kind of motif that's running in various stories in Copeland's book. And then, uh, you know, gradually you had this kind of hollowing out and this unravelling. And so Generation X is not just about a kind of cultural moment. It's about a moment where briefly things had been unravelling for long enough that there was a reckoning beginning to happen with it. And then what happens is, well, you can almost trace it in Copeland's novels, because within a few years, he's writing uh, micro surfs about people working in Silicon Valley, like he's followed the cultural energy where it's going. And this story of the information economy is picking up and displacing the possibility of a reckoning with the real and ongoing social, economic, cultural consequences of deindustrialization in the US and more broadly in the West. Mm. And so all of that gets sort of swept under the carpet by the optimism of the, the Clinton years, the Blair era, etc. And you almost wonder whether if you hadn't had the takeoff of uh, the internet and the dot-com boom and so on in the later 90s, and the thing that was beginning to erupt to the surface uh, that's reflected in the Copeland book, then there might have been a reckoning with stuff that was actually just kept under until you get to 2016 and Trump's election and the, you know, and the Brexit vote and the rest of it. That's, mm. that's just my kind of back of an envelope, what if. But that's, that's a bit, I mean, I, I found that fascinating in Higgs's book, the way he homes in and he has this detail where he's like, mm. you go through the 20th century and for every year, the entries of things that happened in this year on the things that happened in this year page in Wikipedia, there's more of them year by year until you get to those three years between, I think, 91 and 94. So the kind of the KLF, yeah. um, the era when they, they peaked and then when they burnt the money is in this weird liminal doldrums where mm. the story has kind of broken down. Well, yeah, yeah it's uh, fascinating. And that's it because it doesn't pick up again as you say, like until a few years later, till like 97, where you get, you know, this, you get new labor, as you say, you get the Blair years, you get this advent of politics as spin, uh, where it becomes led by opinion polls, not ideology. Um, you know, in, in Europe, you've got Maastricht Treaty, um, you've got George W. Bush emerging as governor of Texas, and crucially, like you say, uh, you've got Netscape Navigator is launched. So this this nihilism that was briefly there in that little interregnum becomes this slightly mindless optimism, which takes us into cool Britannia, and you know, in the UK and the Millennium Dome, um, you know, the dot com bubble, uh, the arrival of cheap cocaine on the high street, uh, and Britpop on the Spice Girls, and all of that, which is which is really the embodiment of a culture of character becoming. A culture of personality that's the sort of shift so what the gay foundation were actually doing was burning a million quid between eras the end of that short 20th century you know the cold war 
and and before the modernity of the late 90s and beyond and if they'd done it earlier it would have been seen as a like a surrealist or a situationist act as you say as part of that possible reckoning that was building that douglas copeland describes and if they'd done it a decade later it would have been seen absolutely specifically as an anti-capitalist one because we would have had the Genoa G8 and the WTO protests that were happening. Right. And, and so what they did, they did something in an absolutely liminal moment in time, which is what makes it so inexplicable. And they couldn't explain it either. That was the other bit. I, I got a, I got a message from Emma Normanton, my friend who was at, at Cheltenham Ladies College when they, the KLF came there. And she said, you know what was what really annoyed us all was that they'd already taken the vow that they wouldn't mm. say anything about it. And she said, and the film, we had to sit and watch. It was really, I mean, Higgs says this in the book. He says, starting burning a million quid is one thing. Finishing burning it is another. It takes a really long time. It's really boring. And then was like, yeah, right. And it was really, really boring to watch as well. And then they wouldn't explain themselves. So, and you've yeah. got to be committed because it's easy to have a second thought halfway through. I mean, critic, the art critic, Charles Shaw Murray, once described Drummond as a magician. He said many of his schemes involve symbolically weighted acts which are conducted away from the public gaze, but nevertheless they are intended to have an effect on a world of people unaware that the act in question has taken place. You know, And that is absolutely magical thinking. And he says Bill Drummond is a cultural magician. Although I think we referenced Alan Moore saying, you know, the thing you must remember about Bill Drummond is he's completely mad. <laughs> You know, and, and it, which comes back to this point, you know, so was it art? Was it magic? Was it mad? And this is where I think Higgs nails it because he says the money was sacrifice. You know, what they did was a statement of intent and the greater the value of what they sacrificed, the greater the focus uh, of that intent. Um, and he says, you know, we all we all know the shared illusion of money. You know, this is part of our great, you know, self-referential reality tunnel um, in which we we do share this perception. It doesn't exist, you know, but it, we genuinely act as if it does, and we strive to keep the money moving. You know, it's almost like keep the economy moving, keep the money flowing, keep all of that stuff moving around. And so, the only perversion, the only the really really act of ultimate desecration you can do is to permanently remove it from circulation and i wanted to come back to you burning money because you have done this Dougald. you have committed the ultimate act of desecration in the context of modernity by permanently removing money from circulation yes it was a five pound note it was very late at night it was i mean definitely in some way uh in the in the shadow of the the klf um and that whole story um uh, I'd like, I'd like, I'd like to be able to tell you more details, but it's a bit hazy. But <laughs> what struck me, what struck me actually when I got to that bit in the book was, I mean, Higgs doesn't quite go there, but it reminded me of something from one of Slavoj Žižek's early books. Did somebody say totalitarianism? Mm. Where uh, he's quoting Lacan and um, saying. You know, there is a kind of value that falls outside of this matrix of use value and exchange value, which, according to Marxism and according to you know, the logics of modernity, is meant to cover everything. Everything's meant to be reducible to this pair of axes. And it's like there's one other kind of value and it's ritual value. And it is mm. sacrifice that, that tears that that net that we're caught in. And that, I mean, that was what always kind of caught my imagination about this this story about mm. them them burning a million quid, but also the bit about them not like not knowing what they were doing, and that as well seems to be this kind of repeated thing. I mean, it's even there in the in in the lyrics. I mean, that's what Tammy Wynette sings. They're justified and they're ancient, and they've still no master plan. Yes, <laughs> the absence of like a master plan. And you know what, that that actually, a, a connection sort of leapt up for me there to something that, that came my way thanks to our friend Liz Slade of the Unitarians, who pointed me towards an, an anonymous substack um, called Philosophy in Hell, written by someone under the, the pen name of Unverified Revelations. And there's this <laughs> essay there called Instead of Your Life's Purpose. And part of it is about 
what the author calls a non-linear approach to meaning. Mm. And it's, this bit is so good and it's so true to, to my experience. But then as I was listening to Higgs tell the story of, of Bill Drummond, I was like, oh, yeah, this is, this is very much his story as well. So the, the advice here is rather than, I'm going to quote, rather than trying to discover a particular arc path and follow it to its conclusion, the non-linear approach to meaning recognises that there will be many different moments and opportunities to create meaning that arise in our life. The idea is not that we will participate in one story that can be easily wrapped up by our biographers, but that there are many adventures and quests that we can pursue. Rather than the attitude of the saint who is given a mission by God, it takes the attitude of the swashbuckling adventurer who goes out to seek his fortune. Instead of imagining yourself as the hero of a Hollywood movie, imagine yourself as a particularly hearty ancestor that you might brag about when drunk. The one who rode bareback, founded a town, fought a grizzly bear, raised ten kids, saved her son's life by drinking the governor under the table, and went to the frontier to stay one step ahead of the hangman and her gambling debtors. And it's that spirit of you know noticing when a door opens and going, oh, I guess there's an invitation there. I'm going to at least stick a limb through it and see whether it gets hacked off or not. <laughs> that is, to me, what the kind of uh, the magic of not having a master plan yeah. for your life or for anything else is that's right there woven through the KLF story. That's wonderful. That is absolutely wonderful. I um, mean, and the other line, as well as having no master plan, is the fact that they're driving ice cream vans. Um, and I, di- I did stumble upon the fact that there was a uh, an Indian takeaway van that was a converted ice cream van in sheffield um uh, on which was painted on the side of which was painted they're justified and they're asian and they're driving ice cream vans uh so you could get your takeaway curry from the van um (laughs) but but that ritual bit is really important isn't it i think if you come back to that because if you go back to robert anton wilson and the illuminatus trilogy now the civilization in that trilogy is based on a religion which is built on usury um and obviously is controlled by the priests so uh, it's it's almost the di- diametric opposite of jesus casting the money lenders out of the temple it's sort of effectively inviting them in um and this priest caste who extracted interest for loans and tributes um from their land ownership so and the first anarchist group that arises in the book specifically to challenge this usury and religious monopoly is of course the justified ancients of mumu and it's like ah okay so this is where this kind of like crazy act of financial destruction comes from and jimmy corty is sort of quoted as saying you know what we wanted to do was control the money like money tends to control you if you've got it it detects what you have to do with it you either spend it you give it away or you invest it we just wanted to be in control of it and arguably what they were doing was trying to you know dispose of the taint of that klf money you know to have some kind of purification or cleansing of their soiled souls and they couldn't keep the money moving because that's what the money wants to do so physically destroying it was the only way to stop it but in order for it to be stopped you know, and this is the Alan Moore idea space bit, is like the idea that it can be stopped must arise, that money is not invincible. And perhaps the powerful ritual impact of what they did in that boathouse on Jura is they made that impossible idea of money being absolutely stopped in its tracks and destroyed thinkable. Hmm. And what do you think the consequences are of that, Ed? Well, I mean, this is where we get into a bit of magical thinking. I mean, you know, so if the fire was about the destruction of money, the idea that, you know, we can defeat money, um, that is the kind of apotheosis of modernity. You know, it's a a potent act in itself to negate the idea of money. Now, Higgs argues that, you know, this planted the seed in idea space for the possibility of, of some of the economic ructions and repercussions that we've experienced since and if you like was a bridge between those two eras into you know the bumpiness of what we now face and that i think comes back to your philosophy in hell piece which 
which I think is another way of describing the multiple model agnosticism that we touched on in episode one, you know, reminding yourself that the model is not the real world, you know. So burning a million quid is both a meaningless act by two attention-seeking assholes who embraced chaos to inevitably end in nihilism, and it's also an incredibly powerful planting of a seed in idea space to build a bridge between eras. <laughs> now, that is, you know, both nonsensical and full of understanding as we sort of go between those competing explanations and we accept the contradictions. If our own liberation loophole is here, then it's about trying to work it out for ourselves what sort of world we're living in, which I think, you know, we also talked about in the context of that Orwell and Spender conversation. Um, and in some respects, I think that's that's a technique that's wholly justified. It's definitely, undoubtedly ancient. Um, and it's also wonderfully humble. Um, and I'm starting to wonder whether that might be my forever project, to go and be that crazy, hearty ancestor um, whose life makes no sense in terms of a coherent narrative, um, but certainly makes for a ribald anecdote. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. We're grateful for all the messages we get from listeners and the other ways you support us sharing these episodes, spreading the word and rating them on iTunes and elsewhere. To explore further along the paths we walk in these conversations, subscribe to my Substack, Writing Home, and check out the online series at a school called Home. You can also find us on Facebook as The Great Humbling, and Ed is at Frucool on the platform formerly known as Twitter. The Great Humbling is produced by David Benjamin Blower, and the title music is I Recall by Blue Dot Sessions. Mm-hmm.